So, Matt, you know how we both like dad jokes and we tell them a lot and everything? Right. I learned that the worst dad jokes are the ones that are written down on paper. They're terrible. <laughs> God. <laughs> That one actually took me a minute. <laughs> uh, <you know? laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the graveyard. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Adam. And my name's Matt. Now, pull up a tombstone or settle into your casket and get comfortable because this is Graveyard Tales. <laughs> All right, everybody, here we are again. Matt, how you doing tonight, brother? Man, I am I am doing better than I thought I would be. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> I had a well, rough good. day, uh, but this is this has been good. This was a good way to finish it, kind of leave all that yeah. crap behind. Yeah, a, a recording graveyard tales and side quests and stuff like that. It's it's therapeutic for me as well. So, yeah. you know, I I didn't have a great day myself, and it it's a lot better now that get into recording. So, um. But we want to say go check out the Podbelly Network at podbelly.com. You can find a list of shows that we're happy to be associated with, and you can find some tips and tricks on podcasting. And I guarantee you there's going to be a, a show on there that you're going to like. I mean, besides us, you're listening to us, and you right, like right, us. Right. <laughs> we hope. We hope you're not hate listening to it. You know, I don't care. If you're hate listening to us, I don't care. You're listening. <laughs> Just keep it It up. doesn't matter. Just keep hate listening. <laughs> Hate um, listen. I don't know if I've ever done that before. You never hate listening to something? Just You hate that person so much, you just have to listen to what stupid stuff comes out of their mouth. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've never done that. <laughs> yeah, I never have either, but somebody's got to do it, I'm sure. While you're on the internet, hate listening to some podcast, either us or, some, I don't know, whatever you're doing. Um, go over to patreon.com slash graveyard tales. Sign up to become a patron. We've got three different levels that you can sign up for. Um, our five and ten dollar a month get video and audio versions of the show that are ad free. Um, our ten dollar a month they get the side quest new show that we've started doing. Um, they get one of those a week, and I mean, you, you pick what you've got the money for. Every every yeah. level is going to get a bonus episode a week. So if you can only afford a dollar, you know, don't feel bad. Go over there and get you a bonus episode for a dollar. It's less than a cup of coffee. Yeah. And you get a bonus episode a week. Yeah. So go over there, sign up. You know, I mean, you can't, Matt, when, what's the last thing you bought that was a dollar and you actually enjoyed? I can't say it because this is a family show. Oh, well, good point. <laughs> good point. It was in a, a truck stop bathroom. <laughs> we'll give you that hint. Uh, but he didn't use it for what it was for. He actually blew it up and then <laughs> stuck it over his head. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Slipped uh, right off. Yeah. Ba-ding. But you know, Adam's. You know, Adam said a, a bonus episode a week. Yeah, you do get that, but you also get a huge ca- uh, catalog that's of true. the previous bonus episodes that we've done, and I mean, and they go from everything from, you know. This this weird place that, you know, we may have visited to us, you know, just quizzing one another to see, you know, which one can uh, figure out what, what stupid thing the other one's talking about. I mean, yep. they are. We did they, news we, of the weird for a while. News we of the weird. We got to do another yeah. one of those. We, we've got another one of those that are, that's coming up. I'm glad you mentioned that. So, um, yeah, go check it out because I, I guarantee you they're they're not like Graveyard Tales. They're a little bit different. Uh, they're They're shorter. But they're a lot of fun. So mm-hmm. check them out. Yep. And uh, while you're checking stuff out, share the show. Share Graveyard Tales on your social media, wherever. Send and if you listen to us on Spotify, you can click share and share the whole page. Share just an episode. Share it with somebody or a group of somebody's and let's grow the show. You know, we, we talked about this early on in the life of graveyard tales. And then we stopped talking about it, but it's very important. You guys 
are the reason that we've gotten to where we have um, in your support and in sharing the show and inviting people into the graveyard. So let's keep that up. Don't don't lag on that like my internet connection does sometimes. <laughs> you know, keep it going. Yeah, uh, share it and get more people into the graveyard. Yeah, you guys a hundred percent are the reason that Adam and I are still able to do this today. Mm-hmm. You know, so so keep it up. So Matt. That's all I've got. Why don't you tell us? What are we talking about tonight, brother? Okay. So uh there's a there's a famous there's a famous line from a song. It says I met a gin soaked barroom queen in Memphis. She tried to take me upstairs for a ride. You know that song? I I have heard that line. Yeah. I can't tell you what song it's out of. That that is the opening line from Honky Tonk Women by the Rolling Stones. Oh, okay. And it was supposedly written about tonight's haunted location. Okay. One of the most famous dive bars in America is also considered one of America's most haunted. So tonight, Adam and I are going to dive into the haunted dive bar, Ernestine and Hazel's in Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah. If you haven't heard of this place, you are missing out. Yeah. And this is this is one of the few places um that Adam and I discussed that I have actually been to <laughs> yeah. multiple times. It's cool. I, I I lived in Memphis because I went to college in Memphis and I'm sorry. Ernestine and Hazel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Ernestine and Hazel's was always a cool place. Um you know, to, to go and hang out on a Saturday night, Mm -hmm. you know, if you wanted to hear some, you know, live music, you know, just, you know, have a drink, get a fantastic burger. Oh yeah. Uh, I hear their burgers are amazing. It just, you know, and, and where it's located, it is, it is Memphis through and through. Yeah. I mean, if, if they had, if they served barbecue there, it, it would be, it would be 100% Memphis. If you had to wrap it up, (laughs) <laughs> yeah this this is memphis right here it is um, one of the most memphisy things that memphis has yeah. ever memphised yeah that's absolutely right <laughs> so if you're looking to check them out uh they're at 531 south main street in memphis it's over there near beale street and stuff like that so you can go down there and check them out but while you're checking stuff out go check our sources down at the bottom of the show notes you can find where we found all this information you can keep going Um, Because like Matt and I have said before, even though Matt has been to this place, there are a lot of places that we can't get to. So we have to rely on the people that have been there, that have had the experiences, have done the boots on the ground history of the place. And all that is in our sources down at the bottom of the show notes. And you can continue the research there if you would like. Um, Now, like Matt was saying, Ernestine and Hazel's is a dive bar that's located in downtown Memphis, and it's been there for years. They, they're they open for lunch, but most of their patronage shows up late at night for that classic dive bar experience. And I'm not a big bar guy. Like, I did for a while in my 20s and stuff, but yeah, I'm not a bar guy because of how crazy they get. Mm-hmm. but dive bars like Ernestine and Hazel's is a different story for me. It's yeah. like, it's a small, like personal place. There's not, you can't cram that many people in there. It's not going to get as wild. You'll still have some wild dive bar stuff happen, but it's not elbows to buttholes of people. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you can get food there, good food. And, and so, it's got a real neat atmosphere from everything that I've heard. So it, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it's casual. They have, they've kept the building, um, as accurate to the time as, as mm-hmm. they possibly can. And it still be safe. Right. Um, and you'll, you'll see reviews on it where it's like, this place looked dirty. You know, there were holes in the wall. Yeah, that's right. There are. Because that hole's probably been there for mm-hmm. sixty years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That and hole has a story. That's exactly. 
And, and if you ask enough people, you'll probably find that story out. Right. Um, but that's, that is part of the allure. Um, you know, it's not all brand new and shiny. Um, it's, you know, it's just there and it's a cool place to hang out and you, you sit around, you meet some very interesting people in there. Um, you know, the staff is, is fantastic. And, you know, as a, as a college bar, um, it's not really what you would, you would consider a college bar, but it was, uh, it was a really cool place to visit. Um, you know, when you were just hanging out looking for like, Hey, you know, what are we going to do tonight? I don't know. Let's, you know, we go out and mess around. It's like, let's go down to Ernestine and Hazel's. It's about 1030, you know, yeah. it'll, it'll be picking up. Yep. You know, so we, we truck down there. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And it reminds me the, the hole in the wall thing, literal holes in the wall thing reminds me being that it's Memphis and it's music related. And I'll get into how, how deeply rooted in Memphis music culture it is, but being that it's music related, it reminds me of. I, many years ago, maybe 20 something years ago, I heard somebody say this and I adopted it, you know, to my life. I was work early on working in the guitar business and I had a musician come in and I was talking to him and he had scratches and dings on his guitar that he was showing me. And somebody said, Hey, you want me to take this over here and buff out those scratches? And he goes, hell no. And the guy was like, what? And he goes, every one of these scratches, every one of these dents is a story. I see this dent. And I remember I was on stage at this, in, in this city, playing this venue, and it fell off the amp and got this dent. And I remember yeah. it every time I see that. So to me now, every one of my guitars that has a dent or a scuff or whatever, it has a story to it. Probably not as cool as this musician's is, but... That's what Ernestine and Hazel's reminds me of every, you know, hole in the wall, every dent in the bar has a story from its long career as a dive bar in Memphis. It's a, a popular Memphis watering hole, like Matt was saying, and everyone says it has great burgers. So downstairs, you can get a cold beer and what they call their soul burger. Mm -hmm. And their soul burger apparently is covered in mustard and onions. And that sounds great to me. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to have to go there not to ghost hunt, but just to get one of their soul burgers. <laughs> it's worth it, man. Get their soul burger and a cold beer. Maybe, yeah. maybe the next time I'm passing through Memphis, I'll stop. Um, but you can also downstairs listen to Memphis soul and funk music on their jukebox that they have. And they boast that they have the greatest jukebox in the country. Now, I don't know how you rate jukeboxes, but apparently theirs is the best. Oh, yeah. You know, for, the, good, for good reason that we're going to get into later. All right. Yep. And I think I know where you're going, but I've heard snippets of the music that they have in their jukebox. One of them is Johnny Cash's Long Black Veil. Mm-hmm. If you've got Johnny Cash on a jukebox, I, I I will agree. You probably have one of the greatest ones in the country. <laughs> yep. Yep. Now you can take a tour of upstairs and then find their small upstairs bar. You know, they don't have much going on upstairs right now, but they do have a small upstairs bar and it's called Nate's famous bar. Uh, and they've got an in-house piano player that will sit there in Nate's bar and play while you know, you're having a drink and it, it's a small bar. It, it's one of those things where you, you're not going to get a ton of mixed drinks and stuff. Nate will give you, you know, you want a gin and tonic, you want a whiskey and Coke, you want whiskey on the rocks. You're going to get that. You're going to get a beer, but you're not going to get some pina colada twisted this way with an up tilt or whatever. They, I don't know what they call it, but um, it's a cool little small bar within a bar, which is neat to me. Yeah. If um, you, if you heard about a new cocktail that was invented in some bar in San Francisco, Nate's not going to make it for you. Nate don't know it. Yeah. <laughs> he he doesn't want to know it. 
That's right. <laughs> Nate has been there uh, working this this bar since the mid nineties, and Matt and I were talking about this before we started uh, started up the mics. But Nate, I heard an interview with him, and he was saying that one night in the bar, and this alludes to some stuff Matt's going to talk about, but Mm -hmm. he's in the bar one night, and one of his customers is up there, and then all of a sudden, this customer just starts hollering, just for no reason hollering, and he runs and jumps headfirst out of the upstairs window. And Nate said, he was hollering, I was hollering too, because I just knew he was dead. And he was. He jumped head first down to the street below and killed himself by jumping out of Nate's bar window. That's so nuts. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. And, and, hor- and horrible to have to have witnessed. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So I can't imagine what that did to Nate or any of the other patrons there at the bar at the time. But anyway, upstairs at one point um, had some hairstylists up there. So it's kind of like a salon, but then later on, it became a brothel. So it has some history to that upstairs. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we'll get into that more. But since they opened, they've been featured in nine movies, written about in Playboy, Esquire, and other magazines. And many, many, many celebrities have visited Ernestine and Hazel's to take in the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. It's It's a long list. Mm-hmm. And I got, I only have a little bit later, I have a short snippet of the list of celebrities that have been there, but it's a long list of people that have stopped in. Now the building that would eventually become Ernestine and Hazel's, uh, started out life as a pharmacy in the 1930s. Now, technically shortly before that, it had a short stint as a church, but there's not much history on that at all. So it was like a church for some number of months, and then it became a pharmacy. And it was a typical pharmacy uh, and ran as such until the owner, Abe Plow, created a product that would get him rich. Now, he started out by inventing a product that could, quote, straighten the hair out. Mm -hmm. While he was doing this, there was a functioning hair salon upstairs being run by two of his employees. Well, Abe's product took off and became super popular from New York York to New Orleans. I almost said New York to New Orleans, (laughs) but you know what I mean? Yeah. New Orleans. Um, It allowed people, this product allowed people to do their hair in those like real slicked back styles that we know from the time period. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather used to use some product similar to this, and he called it monkey grease. Yeah, And when I was a kid, I can remember being five, six, 10 years old and he would do my hair with this monkey grease. And later on, you know, maybe five years ago, I finally found a product that is very similar to that. And I can do my hair because, you know, I'm the way I do my hair is very almost pompadour, but not the way my hair lays naturally. So I had to find a product that is similar to what this Abe Plow made that allows the hair to be slicked and styled in a certain manner. And that's what started getting this Abe Plow famous. Well, later, he became famous for a product that we still use today. I'm sure you've used it. And actually, we keep a bottle of it in all our vehicles because of Ashley's fair skin. Copper tone. Yeah. He first started out with copper tone suntan lotion, and then it later became copper tone sunscreen. So the guy that originally owned the building that is now Ernestine and Hazel's created copper tone sunscreen. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to believe that that started in Memphis. You expect that to start like on the coast somewhere. Right. Right. But I, did you, did you find anything where he had, uh, he had also created, uh, St. Joseph's baby aspirin. Got that coming up. I I jumped the gun on him. Yeah. He, uh, he, he actually did a lot. Um, a plow, uh, he received his only other formal education at St. Paul street grammar school, uh, where he graduated. And after school and on weekends, he worked at the George V Francis drug store without pay because he wanted to learn the drug business. Well, 
he determined that that was going to be his future. So Moses Plow lent his son $125 to start his own business, the Plow Chemical Company in 1908. Don't you wish it only cost $125 to start a business? <laughs> no kidding. We started was, a business. That was probably a ton of money then. Yeah, that's true. We started a business. It was a lot more than that to start. But uh, at age 16, Abe Plow was owner, manager, and the only employee of the new business located in one small room above his father's store. Now, using dish pans for mixing the chemicals, his first formula was for Plow's antiseptic healing oil, a, quote, sure cure for any ill of man or beast. Now, on days when he was not bottling his healing oil, Plow set out in his father's horse-drawn buggy to sell his product to drugstores and country merchants. Well, success came almost immediately for this new enterprise. So within two years, it doubled in size and entered the patent drug business and branched out into cosmetics. Adding aspirin to his line of products in 1920, Plow bought the St. Joseph's Company, a step he called his, quote, first on the road to big time. So, yeah, he he yeah. added aspirin into his stuff and decided that this St. Joseph's Company was going to start making St. Joseph's baby aspirin. Mm -hmm. yep. And I am I wrong in thinking that was the first baby aspirin? I do believe you're right. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. And, you know, it was, it's funny. I mean, you, we don't have baby aspirin anymore, but it's just because they, they changed the name to low dose. Yeah. It's low dose. Okay. And plus we don't really give aspirin to kids anymore. Um, that's why they're weak, Matt. That's why they're weak. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but we did for a really, really long time. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I can remember taking it as a kid. Um, you know, the little I still chewable call it tablet. baby aspirin. Most people I, do. Yeah. You know, my, I mean, especially the, the folks that I talk to, you know, mo most of my patients will refer to it as, as a baby aspirin, or, you know, you'll hear an 81 milligram aspirin, something like that. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's what it is. And, you know, again, it is, it's really, really cool that all of those products started right out of Memphis. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Now, despite the worldwide depression in 1929, Plow actually raised his employees' salaries and added 100 others to his drugstore and factory labor forces. So Plow uh, incorporated and moved in 1951 to 3022 Jackson Avenue, which was a $2 million plant encompassing 250,000 square feet on six acres of land. Well, the business reported net sales of $254.5 million by 1954, a figure that doubled by 1962. Well, it merged in 1971 with Sharing Corporation, primarily a manufacturing a manufacturer of prescription pharmaceuticals. Well, Plow was the chairman of both Plow Incorporated and Sharing Plow. So all of this started in downtown Memphis. Yeah. Right there in the building that was to later become Ernestine and Hazel's. Now you ask, Adam, why did you tell me about Abe Plow and his business? Well, it's to set up so that you understand how much this guy was doing because Abe, from all this, became overwhelmed with his newfound success. So he wanted to move on from his pharmacy and beauty salon. So what did he do? He just gave the building to the two employees who were also cousins who had been running the salon for several years, Ernestine and Hazel. So they got the building given to them because Abe, you know, everything just kind of exploded. They had been loyal employees of his for so long, working the salon upstairs. And he said, you know what? Here, you take it, make it yours. And so they did, but Ernestine and Hazel closed their salon that was upstairs and they turned the upstairs into a brothel and turned the building, the lower part of the building into a cafe. Well, meanwhile, Ernestine's husband, who is a street promoter named Sunbeam, he opened a nearby music joint called Club Paradise. 
Now, wouldn't you like to have the name Sunbeam? Matt? That's what I was going to say. I love that. I love that name. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I never have had a cool name like that. Like, nickname, nothing. Yeah. You know, it, it just, I, I'm not cool enough for a name like Sunbeam. But <laughs> now, this Club Paradise, you know, back then, um, the the music venues and stuff were still segregated. So a lot of African-American performers couldn't perform at the same places that a lot of white performers were. So Club Paradise became the place where these amazing African-American musicians could play. So they hosted acts like B.B. King, Tina Turner, Aretha Franklin, Motown, Ray Charles, Bo Diddley, Sam Cooke, Chuck Berry, and Jackie Wilson. Now, Throughout the next 20 years, these musicians would walk from Club Paradise over to Ernestine and Hazel's every night so that they could get food, they could tell stories about their time playing in other clubs, and they could get a little action with the women upstairs. Yeah. So this is one of the reasons why Ernestine and Hazel's is so ingrained into Memphis music scene because all of these amazing can you imagine you're sitting in Ernestine and Hazel's and BB King walked in I mean I would probably crap myself yeah if I was sitting anywhere especially now but even back then you know now that would be a little weird if BB <laughs> King walked in but or if you crapped then, yourself <laughs> or if I crapped myself either one of them but uh you know back when he was playing and and alive and all that. If, if you were sitting somewhere and BB King walked in and just started talking to you and telling you stories. And I mean, that would be amazing, but it, it became the place where these blues, jazz, R and B soul musicians, funk musicians could go unwind from the gig and just have fun. Yeah. So, they they stopped in all the time. Well, the good times like this, they, they went on until the 70s when Club Paradise got boarded up along with the rest of downtown Memphis. So I don't know if you remember this, Matt. You were, you know, not born or just had been born when this happened. Yeah, I was. But. I was born in 74. Yeah. So. um what happened to Memphis in the seventies? Well, there it's a decrease in population of 27% or put another way, 170,000 people moved out of Memphis of the 1970s as they were incentivized by the quote sprawl that was labeled by the media, political and business leadership as growth. So they were telling people we're buying this land outside of Memphis. You need to move outside of Memphis. Mm -hmm. You know, so it it never really was growth. It was a massive historic out migration that decreased Memphis's density, which hollowed out the core neighborhoods and triggered the decline of the middle class in those areas. And it drove up the cost of the city's public services. The Peabody Hotel was boarded up. Beale Street was in shambles and the Chamber of Commerce actually flirted with bankruptcy. On top of this. That was right when Martin Luther King was assassinated there. And you add this, you know, move out of the city mm -hmm. along with Martin Luther King's assassination and people moving out of Memphis because of that. And Memphis took a deep decline in the 70s with music, bars, everything there just kind of went downhill. Yeah. And. And realize that when I moved to Memphis in 1995, mm -hmm. so this is this is just 20 years after that had happened. Right. Okay. You don't recover from something like this in 20 years. Right. Not so. so not fully. No. So when when I moved down there, the evidence was still around. Mm -hmm. I mean, things were. Things were better for sure, 
um, you know, the Peabody was open and had been, um, you know, Bill street was hopping. Um, but that was all because of the regrowth that occurred in the eighties, right. Um, to try to bring more people back to downtown Memphis, but the evidence was still there that, you know, restaurants like the rendezvous, you know, you, you would, you would, you would park and then you would, you would crawl through a hole in a chain link fence to get to the alley that led you down to the restaurant. And then there was nothing else around it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was old buildings closed, abandoned, and then bam, here's a restaurant. Yeah. Um, you know, that was so common. Um, some place being open for business and having four or five empty buildings next to it. Yeah. You know, you just saw it, but while I lived there, you saw the, you saw the, the growth actually occur in the downtown area. Um, you know, when, uh, when I was there, they, they opened Elvis Presley's on bill street while I was there. Uh, we actually went to the grand opening of that where they had the red carpet entrance and, uh, Lisa Marie and Priscilla, you know, showed up and, and, and and walked in on the red carpet, all these other, you know, actors and other celebrities that had come for that. Um, they had, uh, they had built this giant movie theater downtown, you know, really, really nice. It was, that was back when the, you know, we got 37 theaters, you know, Mm. packed into this multiplex, you know, uh, that those were getting more popular. Um, so it was getting a little bit better because there for a long time, because of all those abandoned buildings, it was just not safe to go walking around. All right. So shout out to Claritin for supporting this episode and providing us with samples. Now, Matt, listen to this, man, that is the clearest I have been in a long time because <laughs> I know you are too, Matt. I know we have a lot of listeners that are seasonal allergy sufferers. And mine get real bad in the spring when everything decides to bloom. And I get watery eyes and a stuffed up nose. And besides that being uncomfortable and irritating, it is a real hindrance when you and I are trying to record an episode. Oh, yeah. Because if we're trying to record an episode, I have to do something to clear out my nose. Otherwise, I sound like this while we're trying to do the episode. And thankfully, Claritin D has helped clear up some of the symptoms that I have from my seasonal allergies. And luckily, for those of us who live with the symptoms of allergies, we can live Claritin clear with Claritin D. Claritin is designed for serious allergy sufferers. Claritin D has two powerful ingredients in just one pill that relieve your allergy symptoms and decongest your nose so you can breathe better. The double action combination of prescription strength allergy medicine and the best decongestant available relieves sneezing, runny nose, itchy and watery eyes, an itchy nose and throat, and sinus congestion and pressure with ease. Are you ready to live life as if you don't have allergies? It's time to live Claritin clear. Fast and powerful relief is just a quick trip away find Claritin D at the pharmacy counter. Ask for Claritin D at your local pharmacy counter. You don't even need a prescription. Or go to Claritin.com right now for a discount so you can live Claritin clear. That's right. Go to Claritin.com right now for a discount so you can live Claritin clear. Please use only as directed. Yeah. I mean, there's you you're essentially alone there's nowhere you could run into um and you know there it that just kind of lended itself lended is lended a word lent sure maybe i don't know anyway it, there were, there were a lot of swarthy characters down there okay <laughs> right right so you were you were just as uh, you were just as likely um to get your car broken into you know, as you were to, to go down there and just enjoy a, a, a fun night out, mm-hmm. you know, you go, mm-hmm. Hey, we're coming back from bill street. Oh crap. My window's busted. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, it, you know, it was a pretty common thing, but you know, that was all before, 
Um, the Redbirds moved down there and had a big, nice baseball stadium downtown before the Grizzlies moved there and they built FedEx Forum. Um, you know, none of that was there when I was there. It was kind of the, you heard the whispers, um, but it hadn't gotten there yet. So, right. you know, it right. was kind of a, it was kind of a weird time when I lived down there. Yeah. I can imagine. Um, so let's fast forward from the seventies when everything closed down to 1992. Now, Bud Chittum and Delmer George bought the Ernestine and Hazel's property. Um, a couple years later, Bud decided to bring on Russell George, no relation to Delmer George, um, who was dancing and singing his way around the area. Now, George owned another nearby bar at the time, and Chittum knew George's like laid-back style was going to be what was needed for Ernestine and Hazel's. Well, Ernestine and Hazel's represents the history of Memphis. You know, the soul, jazz, and blues that Memphis is known for is embodied in Ernestine and Hazel's. And like I said, legends like B.B. King, Tina Turner, and Aretha Franklin used to come in there for relaxation, drinks, and good company. It is the epitome of Memphis downtown spot, and it's yep. been around for decades and survived all of this crap that happened in the 70s, even though it saw hard times and all that, it survived. Yeah. And because of all the unique history that um, that occurred, not only around that area of Memphis, but actually inside the building that housed Ernestine and Hazel's, it has... It has led to some pretty interesting paranormal activity. Mm -hmm. So much so that Ernestine and Hazel's is often called the most haunted bar in America, which, you know, that is quite a moniker seeing as how we've talked about some seriously haunted bars over the years. No joke. You know, when you think about like Bobby Mackey's, Big Nose Kate Saloon, I mean, these mm -hmm. are some places that, um, yeah, I mean, you know, they really have a lot of activity, and for for Ernestine and Hazel's to get that, you know, title, right, it's pretty strong. Now, Karen Brownlee has been a bartender at Ernestine and Hazel's since two thousand and one. Now, in that time, she's been interviewed by multiple sources in regards to the paranormal activity that's reported there at the bar. So, Karen says that. She feels that the spirits there protect her and watch over the place. Even though she says she's not necessarily scared, she does say she doesn't enjoy talking about the spirits while she's at work huh. because she feels that they're listening in and she doesn't want to be disrespectful. Sure. She says that on one occasion, a couple was at the bar making fun of ghosts and talking bad about Ernestine and Hazel. And suddenly the lights began to get brighter and then dimmer and then brighter again and then dimmer until finally the bar was fully lit like daylight. Hmm. Karen said the couple started to freak out and abruptly left. <laughs> That's what yeah. happens. You, 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 you talk crap about the, uh, about the ghosts and the, and the former owners. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to let you know, Hey, mm -hmm. knock it off. Yeah. We don't appreciate this talk. <laughs> now, Karen says that weird stuff happens here all the time. She says that, uh, she's been in the bar by herself and heard the piano playing upstairs. She says it sounds like people are walking around and you can even hear people talking. Hmm. Now, all of the rooms from the brothel are still upstairs. Yep. And paranormal investigators are always up there. They're, they're spending the night. They're, they're doing investigations. And she also says that you can't take a picture in that bar without getting an orb in it. She's like, they're everywhere. Yeah. And you know, I know what everybody says. Oh, you know, that place is full of dust and orbs. Yeah. Yeah. But not in every picture. <laughs> it's not, it's not that common. Yeah. It you know, shouldn't so, be, but yeah. But she also says that she feels like all the spirits are female. Hmm. And she just kind of has that feeling. 
But perhaps that gives some credibility to the rumors that prostitutes were murdered upstairs when it served as a brothel. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're, you know, we're talking about, we're talking about some rough times in American history here. Okay. Um, you know, crimes against different people often went uninvestigated and, you know, a lot of horrible things happened to people that, uh, you know, they know they never got the justice they deserved. Did okay. you find it's just a rumor, but did you find the rumor that in one of the rooms up there, a man had chained a prostitute to one of the radiators up there and beat her to death in one of the rooms? I found that in one source. Yeah. Um, it was only one. And yeah. Yep. I, I didn't include it because of that, but even still, that's not all that uncommon when you're looking for the stories about what happened to the prostitutes that work. Mm-hmm. There. Um, the details are really vague. Okay. You know, there's, there's, there's not case files or police reports or anything. It's just, it's just word of mouth. that has been passed on year after year after year. Well, and it was a brothel and it, in those times brothels were not, I mean, I'm sure it wasn't sanctioned. You know, like you get some in Vegas that are sanctioned and, and so they're kept safe and clean. Mm-hmm. So they just didn't, maybe they didn't even report them because they didn't want to get shut down. It's possible. Now, some regulars say that they have experienced the apparition of a woman standing behind them while they're in one of the upstairs bathrooms. Others have reported seeing the image of a woman standing at the end of the hallway, typically with her arms crossed. And sometimes they have like the old, like, like a bonnet on, like, you know, somebody that, mm-hmm. um, you know, from, you know, probably the, the, the thirties, you know, early forties. Now, some guests have reported, um, being touched when they're upstairs, even pinched. Hmm. Huh. You know, so like maybe even a, a, a playful little goose, you know, yeah. as you walk by. Woo! <laughs> now, Karen uh, talks about a guy that worked at the bar for 15 years. And one day he walked upstairs and then immediately ran back down and out the door. <laughs> and Karen said something up there really, really scared him. But yeah. he, he never could fully explain what it was. Oh, uh, that's weird. Now you've heard I us talk. Know. About, yeah, I'd, I'd want to know too. Yeah, but you've heard us keep mentioning the upstairs. So most of the paranormal activity occurs in those upstairs rooms, but the jukebox that Adam mentioned earlier is one of the oddities that occurs downstairs. Now staff and visitors have reported the jukebox coming on randomly which in and of itself is not that strange. Sure. But if you're having a conversation about baseball and center field by John Fogarty suddenly starts playing, it may make you think that the jukebox is eavesdropping on you. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and they say that happens quite often. Karen tells a story about sitting in the bar with one other employee talking about James Brown's death which had been reported earlier that day when all of a sudden I feel good starts blasting through the bar. That's incredible. And she says another time a paranormal investigator was in there talking about exorcism and stuff. And all of a sudden the song sympathy for the devil by the Rolling Stones started playing. Hmm. Yeah. And Karen, Karen has also mentioned getting touched by someone or something whenever she's standing near the jukebox. Oh, wow. So it's, it's almost like you've got a spirit that hangs out by the jukebox that wants you to know he hears you and is playing stuff. And I mentioned that it has, um, long black veil on there. And the reason that I know that is because the portals to hell with Jack Osborne, they were in there talking to her about the thing and all of a sudden long black veil started playing and it only played like 
the first few seconds of the song, but Jack was like, it's really weird because we're talking about hauntings and that song is mostly about death. Yeah. And it's weird. So they actually caught it doing that, which and I it, thought was neat. It, it is it is common for it to play just parts of songs where it'll just kick on, play part of a song, and then shut off. Yeah. You know, look, it, it, even, even a, a halfway functioning jukebox does better than that. Right. So right. it would play it, the whole thing or most of it. Yeah. And, you know, for it to cut on and off like it does, it really does seem like something is interacting with it. Yeah. You know, maybe, and, maybe it's the medium that it's interacting with humans. Yeah. I was going to say, maybe it's the way it's speaking, like, yeah. you know, with the I feel good part. They were talking about James Brown. Well, he's dead. Well, the guy was like, I'm dead. I feel good. Yeah. You know, James Brown is fine. Yeah, could be. Now, like as I mentioned earlier, orbs showing up in pictures are quite common, um, but they aren't the only thing that shows up in, in people's camera roll. Many visitors have reported seeing faces in the walls when they go back and look at their pictures. That's weird. Now, I I read this and I was like, what does this mean? Okay. So essentially, you know, you snap a picture of the bar itself and then you see when you look back at the photo, like almost like the Shroud of Turin, you know, you see this mm -hmm. silhouetted face in it and that that happens frequently. In fact, it happened so much that I found a TripAdvisor review that said it happened to them and that really? every time they look at their photos, they see more of them. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. And I mean, that it literally sounds like one of those things that's just like, you know, somebody said offhanded once mm -hmm. and it, it gets stuck in, in an article about it. Uh-uh. No, it happens pretty frequently. Yeah. And that that's interesting. Oh yeah. That that yeah, is an really interesting strange. thing. It it almost makes you feel like that the bar, the building itself is alive. That it Oh yeah. It yeah, knows true. what's going on in there. That it and it interacts with the people that come in. True, yeah. Now, I I mentioned earlier voices are common upstairs. The staff reports that it's difficult to make out words, and it often just sounds like muffled conversations between several people. But one cleaning person consistently reported hearing voices when he would go up there to clean up. Hmm. And he said whenever he walked into one particular room, he would hear, here he is again. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's, this is people thought he was crazy, you know, but he... Always. He probably thought he was crazy too. <laughs> Maybe a little bit, you know, but that wouldn't that, that would just make you kind of go, I, I really don't want to have to go up here and clean up tonight. You know, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to hear this. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, as I said, stranger things have happened that make the bar itself seem like it's a living, breathing entity. Now, there is a story about a money bag, like, I guess, like a zippered bank bag, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know it's had a lock on the end. Anyway, one of those went missing, okay, mm. that had a few hundred dollars in it. Now, Karen says that one day the bar was dead and that she and one of the other, one of her other coworkers were shooting pool. Now, she took a shot and the cue ball managed to bounce off the table and it rolled underneath one of the sofas. That's a horrible shot. Yeah, it's a terrible shot. I've seen it a hundred times though. It's mm -hmm. off shot. I've been hit by one. So, <laughs> so they, they went over there to get the cue ball back and they, they moved the sofa and they found a money bag covered in cobwebs. That's weird. It, it had obviously been there a really long time. So she called the manager and he said he didn't know anything about it. The very next week, I mean, the, the, the sat, the next Saturday, 
the same thing happened with the cue ball coming off of the table and rolling under the same sofa. Again, they went over to move the sofa to get the ball, but this time another money bag was underneath. That's weird. They'd already taken one. Now there was another one, but that one they found was the one that had been missing for at least four or five years. Oh, wow. So the, the crazy thing is that they find the, an old money bag in there. It doesn't mm-hmm. have the right amount of money. It's covered in cobwebs. It's obviously been there a really long time, but it's not the one that was lost. And a week later, the one that had been lost appears in the same spot. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, you know, Karen says, you know, you, you'll hear these stories. You won't believe them, <laughs> but they're, but they're true. They happened. Yeah, it's like but, gremlins or something. Like, I know. Yeah, you got like there's the there's a in there a trick a trickster in there somewhere. Mm-hmm. Now, Adam Adam brought up the the murders, and we talked about that a little bit. And as I said, the the history is vague, but it is said that thirteen people allegedly met their demise inside Ernestine and Hazel. Now, Russell George, um who was the original manager and promoter that was hired by Bud Chittum. Uh, he was there when the, with the current iteration of the bar, when it opened in 1993, he committed suicide in one of the upstairs rooms. Okay. So that's, that's one that they know of for sure. Yeah. In July of 2019, bones were found inside one of the walls while the bar was undergoing some renovations. Phew. Now, the news reports state that the bones were sent out for examination, but I could not find any reports of what those examinations discovered. Hmm. So whether they were human bones, whether they were animal bones, they found a few other things in there with them. Like, uh, I think they found like a, like an, uh, like a five cent peanut bag. Um, I think there was a bottle of whiskey in there. It was hmm. empty. Um, you know, things like that. And these bones. That's weird. Um, so it either makes me think, okay, so if they were human bones, you think that would come out because that sure, would yeah. prompt. I mean, they were doing renovations. So the contractor is who found them. Yeah. And so immediately, you know, he's, he's got to stop everything he's doing. He's got to report it to the police and there's got to be some investigation before he can continue his work. Right. Um, because they want to make sure, you know, this isn't a, a body of a, of a murdered individual. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was no other story. And I'm, and I mean, I got this story from the actual news station, you know, yeah. so that, you know, so this was, you know, just, just about five years ago. Um, so it's not like it's an old story and the stuff had gotten lost. It's I I couldn't find anything about what the bones were. That's weird. I don't know why they wouldn't say, I mean, if the original discovery made the news, yeah. there needs to be a follow-up at so least it, saying, Hey, it was animal. Yeah. It, it, that's what it, that, and that's what it tells me is that it must, they must've been animal bones. Right. Right. So that it wasn't really all that newsworthy, yeah. but you know, cause I, I can't imagine if they found human remains inside that that wouldn't be. Yeah. They would have the to biggest, say something. I'd biggest think. stories, you know? But there are stories of prostitutes being murdered upstairs. But again, the details are fuzzy at best. But there is one particular story that comes from the black room. Now, the upstairs rooms are color coded. So there's a black room, red room, green room. You know, they're painted. They have those color lights. Well, I don't think the black room has black lights in it, but it might. It'd be nasty for a brothel to have (laughs) black lights. (laughs) Gross. (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah you ever watch csi uh uh-uh. yeah you know but there is a there is a record player with uh an old record player with a radio uh you know combo now the record player doesn't work but the radio still does and the radio in the black room turns on and off randomly and changes volume. In fact, hmm. I read I read one uh, one investigator 
um, was talking about having been up there and when, and a ghost tour came through. Okay. So he was, he's there in in normal business hours. So a ghost tour comes through and he says, when they were in the room that was adjacent to the black room, the volume went down. Hmm. And then when they left, it went back up. And he remembered thinking, hmm, that's kind of weird. But he went back and noticed that it happened frequently. It wasn't just one time. So he knew he wasn't nuts. Yeah. You know, this was really happening. And the, the and like I said, it'll turn on and off. It does all kinds of things. So uh, there, there's something else that's kind of special about the black room. Now, Karen Brownlee, who we've been talking about, she, the bartender and one of the current managers, shares a story where one evening she found an anonymous note and a bouquet of white roses left on her bar by a customer. Okay. The note read, and this is a quote, this is the actual note. The other night I had an experience in your bar that I cannot explain. There is a spirit there that endured a very hard life and a terrible experience, and she wishes to be heard. It's my understanding that she was stabbed in the shoulder. I have never encountered or felt anything like this before, so I am unsure if I'm misinterpreting. Please make sure that this letter and roses make it to the green lit room with the painting of a woman and the brick covered window so that she may see them. Hmm. I mean, I, I it's look, we, strange. we, we have done a lot of research about a lot, a lot of haunted places. We've not ever come across something quite like this where, yeah, you know, a, a, just a customer has some type of spiritual interaction that is so emotional. It, it prompts him to, to make a gesture like this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and this was I'm sorry and this was in the green room. I think I said this was in the black room. This was in the green room. Okay. But the the note goes on and it says I want her to know that I cried uncontrollably and felt her pain and I'm so deeply sorry from the bottom of my heart. Her beautiful soul deserved better. I write this with hopes that she may find her peace knowing that she was heard and felt. I hope so deeply that she may let go of this pain and find joy and light. I mean, that's just, it's incredible. Yeah. I have never heard of something like that where you have an experience and then the guy comes back, leaves flowers for, uh, the, the spirit that he feels so bad for. I don't, what, what, what it tells. What it tells me is that no no matter what you believe, you believe in ghosts, you don't, you think this place is haunted or not, it doesn't really matter. Here's a guy that is looking for, and I say guy, it may not have been, but here's someone that is looking for zero attention. Yep. And whatever experience that they had led them to do this. You just, you've got to think that guy, that person, they experience something, something heavy to do that. Something they could not explain. Yeah. So it, it, it just, it drives that nail deeper and says, this place, this place has got, it's got something. It's got ghosts. It's got spirits. It, it's an entity in and of itself. Um, for someone to have an experience like that, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just, I, I thought that story was incredible. And if you think that one is, 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 is fascinating, we're going to close with this one. And Adam and I talked about this before and we, we thought this was a really neat story. Yeah. I um, love this one. So we wanted to share this. So this is, this is from Karen and it says in 2007, my 24 year old son got killed. I was at work and found out that he had gotten shot to make a long story short. This was how I knew that it was Ernestine. At least I think it was Ernestine that was watching out for me. 
when I came back to work, I was sitting at the end of the bar by myself and I was crying. And I said, God, please give me a sign that my kid is all right. And she said, it used to be when I got freaked out in here that I would just start talking to Ernestine. I know that sounds crazy, but sometimes you're in here by yourself and it can get a little creepy. Mm -hmm. I said, Ernestine, please give me a sign that my kid's all right. And out of nowhere, this little baby bird came walking up to me right over from one of the booths. I looked down and the little bird walked over to an iron gate where the door was open and it flew off. She said, that, that was my sign that my kid was okay. When I started talking to Ernestine and the bird appeared and flew off, that was, that told me everything was okay. Yep. She said, it was so weird. And just then this little lady came in that I had never seen before in my life. She walked in and said, Hey lady, are you okay? I don't know where she came from. Never saw her again but I started talking to her a little bit about everything. And you know, that lady left my bar and she came back about an hour later and she had bought me a sterling silver necklace with a bird on it. I don't know what her name was or anything. She gave me that necklace and a big old hug and left. I never saw her again. Now, is that not something right there that she came back with a necklace with a bird just like that? She says, this is a true story. I'm not lying. Um, And at the time, Russell George told her, Karen, Ernestine is watching over you, man. Yep. She said, I've never been scared in here since. She said, I'll hear weird stuff, but I'll blow it off. I love this place. It's like my home. I've had so many good people, had so much good stuff happen to me here. And some people get real eerie and freaked out, but I don't anymore. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, yeah, what an incredible story. Um, you know, almost as if maybe so, you know, maybe so. Maybe mm-hmm. Ernestine is looking out for her. And Ernestine, I think it was Ernestine was she lived till like 1998. She um, lived a long time, yeah. Yeah. Um, she was still alive, and I think Hazel may have still been alive when the the current Ernestine of Hazels that opened in 93 um, began. Um, I, I do think they, they may have both still been alive, but yeah, um, I got a little snippet to add to that bird thing, Matt. Okay. It was, um, apparently birds are a, a big thing at Ernestine and Hazel's as far as like paranormal sense that you get. Um, there was a, uh, a medium doing a blind walkthrough. They knew nothing about the hauntings or whatever that went on there. They went upstairs and they said, oh man, I'm getting this heavy feeling like just something feels wrong, you know, feels bad. I'm kind of dizzy. And then all of a sudden she kind of moved and they said, what happened? She goes, it felt like a bird flew past my face. And she goes, it wasn't negative. It actually cleared up the energy, but it was just weird that a bird flew by. Now, she didn't know anything about this lady's story about the bird or anything. And to have a bird, a bird, like the feeling of a bird fly past your face and it clear up that negative energy just kind of add to me adds to that bird as a good sign yeah. that it might be Ernestine that's keeping, you know, some negativity at bay in this place. That That is, that's pretty cool. I mean, it, it really, really is. And, you know, birds have been viewed as omens, you know, for centuries. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, so, you know, if, if, if it's Ernestine spirit or another spirit that takes the form of a bird, you know, it's, uh, it's gotta be a positive thing. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's gotta be. So, you know, I've been to Ernestine and Hazel's. I know that we've got listeners that have been. I never had any kind of experience there. Okay. I, my experience there were of spirits of a different kind. Um, yeah, the bottled kind, (laughs) but, but if, if we've got listeners that have, have been there, 
you know, maybe you've had an experience or you've talked to somebody there that had an experience, let us know. And the best place to do that is in our Facebook group. Uh, it's called the graveyard, thousands of members sharing these really cool experiences, you know, sharing their jokes, even asking for help with Mm -hmm. paranormal problems. You know, it's a, it's a great place. It's a safe place to come and share those stories. All the members are amazing too. They're they're great, friendly people. The the best group out there in our opinion. Um, but when you're done there, you can slide over to our website, which is graveyardpodcast.com. And there you can find links to purchase Graveyard Tales merchandise. You can listen to the show and you can become a patron. And as we said at the beginning of the show, look, even a, even for a dollar, you get access to all those bonus episodes, a, mm-hmm. a new one each week. And that back catalog that's whew, well over, well, I don't even know how many in there. Oh, dude, hundreds. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> And, and, and Ernestine is telling me that it's time to wrap it up. My, <laughs> my, my light just went out. So, uh, I, man, I tell you this, I told Adam, I told Adam yesterday, I said, this is going to be a great show tonight. Yep. It was like, you know, from the, the research we've done, I said, I think this is going to be a fantastic show. And, and it was. So until next time, we'll save you a seat in the grave. See you soon.